Other questions? Okay, so the last thing we did was uh, three by three lemons, or it was part of it anyway. Let me give you uh, the following theorem. This is called the snake lemon. How many of you have ever heard of the snake lemon? But uh, this is actually very important homological algebra in particular. Uh, consider the following community diagram. Uh, with exact rows. So this is painted in slightly more general um, picture than, than you want, or, or than we had before. It's A1, A2, A3. Um, H uh, right two, 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 three. Um, so if you take a if you take a course in homological algebra a little bit later. In your career, if you've had one, this is actually uh, sort of the meat and potatoes behind some of what's called the connecting homomorphisms. So here's the uh, here's the statement of the theorem. Then there exists an exact sequence uh, from the kernel of G1 kernel of G2 kernel of G3 uh, right we call this alpha 1 alpha 2 make a co-kernel G1 into the co kernel of G2 into the co kernel of G3. Um, I want to call these beta one. And here's the snake part. This is uh, uh, delta here. Additionally, If F1 is one to one, so there's alpha one. And if uh, H2 is on two, so what this allows you to do is, of course, you have the kernel of A1 is contained in A1, or I'm sorry, the kernel of uh, G1 is contained in A1, the kernel of G2 is contained in A2, and the kernel of G3 is contained in A3. And these alphas are really just restriction maps, right? So take something in the kernel here, uh, when you restrict F1 down to the kernel, that's what I'm calling alpha one. So you can go from kernel to kernel to kernel, and then you snake back to co-kernel, do y'all remember what the co-kernel is? Okay, so make a quick sign there is if you have F A and B, right, if you have a harmonic homomorphism, then the kernel of that is equal to all the stuff in A such that F of A is equal. The co-kernel of that is B my image. Right, so the co-kernel of this is just 
the target, which in this case is B, modulo the image of that, or modulo that submodule, the image of F. All right. This is kind of this is kind of a funny one. This is kind of mapped in the movies. Uh, how many of you uh, watch horrible movies? Lots and lots of horrible movies, like me. Nobody else watches bad movies. So uh, how many of you have heard of the movie "It's My Turn"? Anybody ever heard of this? It's. A, do you know who Michael Douglas is? Uh, <laughs> saw Wall Street, didn't you? Manson Stone, any of this? I'm getting old. Uh, anyway, um, so it's my turn. Is kind of this midlife crisis uh, movie. There's a professor played by Jill Clayburn, and Michael Douglas plays this kind of baseball player, and she goes through kind of a crisis. I think and kind of hooks up with this baseball player, or whatever, redefines herself or whatever. But the beginning of the movie uh, is set in a graduate class, and she proves the snake limit. Right, not in complete detail, but you won't find too many mainstream movies where the snake one was proven. But she really does it, and it's an amusing scene because there's this snarky graduate student that keeps trying to shoot her down, and he's a total Dorcas Mullerkus, and he's always wrong. Uh, but anyway, so there, there's an interesting proof of the snake one and stuff, and I used to actually have this on my homework to prove. It's it's not really hard to prove, but it's tedious. But I used to say, um, you know. There's this movie you can go and get to prove the snake lemma. But your punishment is if you use the movie to prove the snake lemma, you have to watch the whole movie. And believe me, it'll be punishment. But anyway, so um, what I want to do in this, so you all are graduate students, so you can kind of verify this for yourself. This is pretty easy, and so is this. Uh, and the exactness follow from chasing the diagram. You should check it out. What I want to do here is show you. Um, how to connect the kernel. I mean, because that's the, really the interesting part of the snake limit. These are just induced by these maps here, F, and these are induced by the maps down here, H. The interesting part is the snake part, because actually what this says is somehow I can get from the kernel of this map, so a bunch of stuff over here in A3, into the co-kernel of this, into something that's B1 mod um, the uh, G1 of, uh, right, B1 mod the image of G, right? It's not so clear how to get from here to here, right? Well, so let me kind of sketch this here. Um, so how are we going to do this? Okay, so let's kind of let, let me kind of show you how the snake works, and I'll show you it's well defined, and that will be the details of, of what I did here. So let's start with let X be in the kernel of D3. So our goal here is find how the snake works. Okay, so I've got X here, and it's in the kernel G3, so that means it goes to zero. Agree? Now, notice that this is on to, uh, for the state limit to work, I don't necessarily need this to be one to one, and I don't need this to be on to, but this is on to, so I can pull back to some Y here. Agree? Now, what I'm going to do, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna use kind of sloppy notation here. Um, this is kind of the common thing to do. What I do is X, look at a pre-image of X, right? Well, now I follow this down here to some Z, right? So, G2, 
And then notice that if I follow this down to some Z here, where does Z go under H2? It has to go to zero, right? Because Y goes to here, which goes to zero, since X is in the kernel. That means Z must go to zero, right? Which means that Z actually has a pullback here, right? And I will call this uh, B. And so I'll call this H1 inverse. So here's the way the snake works. You start with something that has to go to zero, see what goes to it. We're guaranteed that such a thing exists. Push it down here. Now, since this goes to zero, it comes from somewhere here, right? And this B, which I call my diagram, is the image of this. Now, I'm being super sloppy about this, right? Can anybody, can anybody tell me two super sloppy things about this? Okay, right, the inverse, right? First big problem. X certainly has something here, Y, that goes to it, but there's no reason. In fact, it's probably not unique, right? So I've made a choice here, which might not be well-defined. Now, once I've made that choice, this is well-defined because G2 is a function, right? And I'll make another observation is this Z, the pullback here, is well-defined. Can somebody tell me why? So once I get here, my choice of B is uniquely determined. Can somebody tell me why? That is right, because this is one to one. The fact that Z goes to zero means there is something back here, but the fact that this is one to one means it's unique. So I've got problems in my first step here, right? I, I might have. And another thing that's really kind of sloppy here is I really should write plus image of G1. Because it's not just B itself, B is just a coset representative. Because remember, my, my target for delta is supposed to be in the uh, co kernel. So it's got to be something in B1 mod the image of G1. Okay. So let me argue that <laughs> despite the concerns, Uh, delta is well defined. And let me kind of let me kind of demonstrate why that's true here. Um, my big problem, my big problem was in my first step here, right? Notice I might have another choice, right? Orange Y1 might go there now. Orange Y1 goes down to orange Z1. Right. Notice that again, Z1 goes to zero. Right? So Z1 has a pullback that is unique here, B1. Everybody okay with that? So here's the problem. The problem is this could also be. Also, B1 plus image G1, right? Because if I if I chose a different Y1, it gives me a, perhaps a different B1, right? And that could be problematic, right? Does anybody see why ultimately it's not going to be a problem? Okay. So notice that. Uh, Notice that there exists an A1. I'm going to burn my eyeballs out. Y minus Y1 goes to zero here, right? Which means that there is some A1 that goes here, right? That, that goes to Y minus Y1. Agree? Now let's follow A1. This way, well, and of course, y minus y1 uh, goes to down this way, 
uh, C minus C minus. Okay, and this was the red. So there's an A1 that goes here and goes to Z minus Z1, right? Now, of course, the diagram commutes. And so um, this goes somewhere, let's say, to, I'm running out of letters here. This goes to C, and C goes to Z minus Z1. Okay, so so what have we got here? Well, we know that H1 of C is C minus C1, right? But this is also, notice uh, B minus B1 also goes to C minus C1. Everybody agree with that? Now, again, H1 is one to one, right? Which means but where is C? C is N, an image of whatever it is, G1. So this means B minus B1 is in the image of G1. So B plus MG1 is equal to B1. So in particular, these two cosets represent the same, or the, these two symbols represent the same coset. So this, this delta actually is honest to good as well defined. Right. Uh, of course, I have not shown you that this is a homomorphism. Uh, and that this thing is exact, but that's just, uh, this is the hard part of the theorem problem, is the snake works in a well-defined fashion. Okay, any questions? Okay. Um, let me uh, give you the following theorem. I have defined this term before, but uh, let me, let me kind of re-emphasize here. Uh, uh, and before I do this, um, well, actually, I should, I, I, I think if I can here. 6.4.8, uh, let R be a ring, and suppose we have the following short exact sequence of R modules. Zero, the a short exact sequence of R modules. Uh, the following conditions are equivalent. Number one, uh, there exists, what should I start? H. Or not homomorphism. H from C to B, such that when I do uh, G, then I do A. Uh, I'm sorry. When I do H first, G is the identity on C. Um, two, there exists R module homomorphism. Problem A from B to A. Such that uh, when I do K and then I do, or when I do F and K, I get the identity function on A. And finally, three, zero, 
A, B, the C. is isomorphic to sequence zero a a sub c and c zero where this is inclusion a is projected c with uh, identity maps at both ends. So let me uh, let me tell you what I mean by isomorphic. I haven't told you what I mean by that. So let me kind of spell it out for you. What do I mean for these two short exact sequences to, to be isomorphic? And actually, it doesn't matter which way you draw it. It means that means that there exists this community diagram zero. And zero a a subset zero C. And this is what I mean by the yeah, identities at the ends, and I'll call it some pitchfork. So this is what I mean. Uh, more generally, you can say these sequences are isomorphic if these vertical maps are all isomorphisms. But in fact, under this theorem, you can even specialize it to where these are in fact the identity, uh, the identity isomorphs. So this is what I mean by two sequences being isomorphic. I think if you start thinking about what it means for sequences to be isomorphic, this is kind of what you would think, right? That this these sequences are essentially doing the same thing. So the, the, you got to link them up with diagrams. Can you? Everybody okay with that? Uh, any such sequence we call split is act. So a split exact sequence is like a short exact sequence on steroids. It's a, it's a stronger version of it. Um, every split exact sequence is a short exact sequence, but the converse is true. Uh, uh, let me also make a remark. If zero A, B, C, mark part. It's split it's act, then it is always the case that B is isomorphic, the ends, the direct sum of the ends. That is always the case. Uh, the converse is not true in general. That is, there are counterexamples to this other direction. But they're not trivial, right? And I'll ask you to do one probably on the next homework. They have to be big in a certain sense, but it's not finally generated. So let me give you kind of a quick non example. Yes. Um, so when you say, so like you, you say it, we have this isomorphism with, with identity maps of both things. Would it, would it ever be possible for you to have it? When those maps were not identity, yes. How would that? What would that look like? Well, I mean, if you had if you had a non-trivial, um, if you had a non-identity isomorphism of this and a non-identity isomorphism of this, then it's got an inverse, so you can make a third row of this with the inverse and kind of patch it all together and do it that way. If you like, so for example. Um, so yeah, so if you had some uh, 
if you had some isomorphism that wasn't the identity, then you could put another row here with the inverse of that. And when you patch this all together, you'll get the identity here, right? And so you could do it that way. So take anything like this where A and C have non-trivial, and you can probably play around with it and come up with something that will work for you. If, if you like, I'll, I'll come up with a concrete example. Let me give you actually a non-example of its split excitations. So here's the way my, my uh, homomorphisms are going to work. Uh, N goes to 2N, right? So this is basically this function here just doubles everything. It's just the R module homomorphism, you get multiplication by two. And here, my homomorphism This just reduces everything mod two. So in other words, all the evens go to zero, all the odds go to one, right? Like that. It's easy to check that this is a short exact sequence, but it is not split exact because Z is not isomorphic to Z sub Z2, right? Uh, let me give you a quick couple of things. First of all, how many elements in Z have finite order as a group? Only, only zero. Everybody agree with that? This has only the identity as an element of finite order. This has multiple elements of finite order, right? So they can't be isomorphic. Another way to see it's not split exact is there is no non-zero homomorphism that goes from Z2 into Z, right? Because everything in Z2 is a finite order. And so you have to send everything of finite order to something of finite order over here, which forces everything to go to zero. Right. So there's two ways to see that that's not split exact. Okay. So let us pursue a proof of this. Uh, any questions? Go on. Okay. So let's try one implies two. Uh, so we have an R module homomorphism so you've got G and then we've got H such that when you do H and G you get the identity of C we want to somehow build We need to find an R module homomorphism K that goes from B to A. Now, I call this uh, laundering. I feel like a money laundering. I got to clean some stuff out of here. So, my question is how in the blazes am I going to start with some B in B and get to A? But how, how am I going to do that? Right? I mean, the only thing I know is the function goes in here. In fact, it's not even clear that B has a pre-image back here. Right. So for example, I mean, if you look at if you look at this exact sequence right here, if I pick B, if I pick B equals one here, there is nothing that goes to one because this thing goes into the E, right? So there's no there's no way that I can do that. Any ideas? Could you send B to like the kernel of G and then? Okay, that's a, okay, yeah. Somehow we're gonna to have to use G and we're gonna to have to use this, this uh, function H that goes back. It's often called a splitting, right? So here's what we'll do. I'm gonna put this in the washing machine. B goes over to G B, right? Something in C. And then I'm gonna smack this back to H. Now, HGB is also an element of B, 
It might be B, but probably not, because remember, uh, it's GH that's the identity, not HG. But I've cleaned it up. This is a cleaner version of B. I put it in here, and there's the spin cycle. It comes out all nice and fluffy here. What because what happens when I do when I go back here again? This is GHGB, which equals GB because GH is one. Right? So in particular, B in the clean version of itself go to the same place over here. Do I agree with that? So that is to say, uh, G of B minus is zero. Right. So B minus uh, the clean version of itself, uh, HGB, If this is in the kernel of G, it's the image graph. And that's what I'm going to do. I define K of A uh, let's see, well, I'm sorry, not K, but K of B equal A uh, where F of A is B minus G. Right? So what I do, this is the way this, this animal works. The way K is going to work is I read whatever B is. Then I, I clean B. I take I take B minus HGB. Um, right? And that's an element of this kernel. And I see what A goes to it. Right? Notice that this is well defined, right? Because um, when I when I when I take B and then I get B minus GHB, of course, this is the identity function. GH is a, is a function, so this is a well defined element. I know that there is an A that goes to this because of the fact that that sequence is exact. And this A that goes to B minus GHB has to be unique because why? Right. Uh, F is well defined. I'm sorry, K is well defined. As F is one point. Right. That pre image has to be unique. Everybody okay with that? Now, what is not clear, perhaps, is the fact that this is an R module homomorphism, right? And I'll do the additive part and leave the multiplicative part to you, I think. So um, what we want to do is we want to, we need to show K of B1 plus B2 is K B1. Okay, so that's the abelian group uh, part of this. So notice that um, uh, Right. Now notice that F of A1 plus F of A2 is B1 minus HGB1 plus B2 minus HGB2, which I'll take some liberties here, B1 plus B2 minus HGB1 
what we do. Because G and H are both R module homomorphism, so there will be a group homomorphism, so we can do that. Everybody okay with it? And so notice that this is. Uh, right. All right. So K of B two, just by the way that we define this and the fact that F is a F and of course GH are also R module homomorphism, we get this right here. Uh, verify K of RB is R K B. But this one's actually even a little bit easier. Okay. Uh, so finally, um, I guess we need to sort of verify to ourselves also note that if A is in A, then if you do uh, F A A, this is K F A, this is playing the role of B, and k of f of a is equal to a if f of a is equal to this. Well, notice that um, right. Notice that f of uh, uh, g h. This is playing the role of B because this is equal to well, right, B this way. Um, right, let's do the second thing. This is F of A minus G, uh, G H F of A. Notice that, um, oh, I'm sorry, this is a uh, did I write this one in one place to see? Yeah. Yes, I did this this way correctly. Yeah, this is why I do algebra, not analysis. This should be HD. There we go. And the reason I caught that is because I know that this has to be zero. Notice the sequence is exact. So when you do F, and then G, you get zero, and this is K of A. So if I do K, F of A, this is A for all A and A. So this is the identity on A, which is exactly what we want. Okay. Now for the two implies three, I want to get this uh, isomorphism over here. So two, let's see here, that's the one where this, so I've got F, got G, and now I'm assuming that I've got a K such that uh, when I do that K, this is the identity of A. Now, somehow I want to show that this is isomorphic uh, to that uh, other sequence here. This is inclusion of A. So uh, just for clarity, let me uh, 
reminds you of what I mean by this, is this takes the element A to A comma zero. And this is projection on C. This takes A comma C to C. I want this to be the identity of A. And I want this to be the identity function. And our burden is to go pitch for it here. So, Help me out here. I need to define, I need to show that there's an isomorphism. So I need to define a function. It's got to be an R module homomorphism, and I want it to be an isomorphism. My input is something from B. My output needs to be an order pair in A and C. Prescriptions. Right. I'm hearing from Calvell. A, B. And right. If it ain't easy, don't do it. This is the easiest way that I know to take a B and associate something in A and something in, in, in C, right? Now let's just cross our fingers if this works, right? This is an R module from the morphism. And I think I can leave that to you because. Both coordinates are R module homomorphism, so it's easy to verify that this works. Right? Um, the question is, is why is it an isomorphism? Uh, well, let's see. How about one to one? Let's show that first. Uh, how do we show that this thing is one to one? Well, let B. In the kernel pitchfork. Well, this means that KB and GB, that's zero, zero, fine. So um, we need to somehow conclude the B is zero. So, how do we do this? Well, uh, let's compose this with F. Uh, uh, if GB is zero, this implies B is an image of that, correct? Because G of B is zero, that means that there's something that uh, this goes to. So, so uh, this means that KB equals AFA. But KF is the identity, which is A. But KB is zero. So A is zero, and it for is one one. Now, how about on to? You can do some uh, computations. I'm going to cut you short on this. Um, so what uh, A C I need to find an appropriate element of B so I'm, I'm just going to kind of show you the answer to this and maybe you'll perhaps see why it works. I'm gonna verify this works. Try this. Let B be A. Um, right. Well, here for a moment. All right. Perfect. 
first select any B such that uh, G of B is equal to C. Right? And this can be done uh, because uh, G is on to it, right? So I'm going to select any one that I want. It can be arbitrary. Now, my, uh, I need to, just like before, I need to kind of uh, adjust uh, my choice here. Now consider the element But X be B minus uh, FKB plus A. Where, of course, A is here, B is selected this way. Now, this was basically come up with by doing some computations. If you look at pitchfork of X, this is. Uh, K of B minus uh, FKB S B and then uh, G of B minus FKB plus F. So this is K of B minus K F K B plus K F A. And we have D of B minus G F K of B plus G F A. What a mess, right? But notice that. KF uh, is the identity. This is the identity on A. So this is K of B minus K of B. So these two kill each other. And this is again KFA. So I get A in the first coordinate because that's the identity on A as well. Now, what happens in the second? Notice that because the sequence is exact, when you do F and G in tandem, you get zero. So that's zero. So these two are gone. And you get G of B, which was chosen to be C. Definition, so it's on. The implication three implies one is the easiest, uh, I think. Uh, so you all think about that, and maybe we'll pound that out next time. Uh, any questions? Any questions on this? All right, so we're two thirds away about that. Think about the third piece. We'll do that next time. Um, and if there are any questions, we'll just see you all on Friday. Oh, by the way.